Well, good afternoon. I'm Isabel Gonti, Director of Examinations at the CFP Board. I'm pleased to present this webinar about updates for the upcoming March 2016 examination and also future exams moving forward. Uh, please note that you can use the Q&A pane to ask questions during the webinar. We will answer these questions at the end of the presentation. So let's start with the webinar and discuss what has changed compared to what the exams looked like until now. Uh, during the webinar, we will review information about the 2015 job task analysis and how this impacts the March 2016 exam and all future exams. We'll talk about the exam blueprint and the exam structure. We'll talk about how to prepare for the exam. We'll also talk about deadlines and exam fees for the March 2016 CFP exam. And then we'll talk about the March 2016 exam results. So let's start about to talk and talk about specifically about the job task analysis. Approximately every five years, CFP Board conducts in partnership with Prometric, our testing vendor, a job task analysis study for the practice of financial planning. Uh, the job task ana analysis incorporates a multi-method approach that involves a number of subject matter experts, also an analysis of emerging trends in the profession, and a large-scale scale survey of practicing CFP professionals and educators from registered programs. The purpose of the job task analysis is to develop and validate the tasks and knowledge related to the work performed by CFP professionals, considering their practice and also emerging trends. It's also to develop test specifications, or what we call blueprint, for the CFP exam. And we'll talk a little bit more about the blueprint later in the presentation. And it also provides research-based topic requirements for registered programs and also for continuing education. So this slide is actually showing you the outcomes of the 2015 job task analysis. Um, it shows the comprehensiveness and integrative aspect of financial planning. It, it illustrates um, how financial planning knowledge topics and financial planning domains, and also the contextual variables all play together uh, as part of financial planning practice. Uh, this is, you know, the, the integrated aspect and all of those elements, this is what will be used by registered programs and also for exam development moving forward as this is the most updated breakdown of financial planning practice. Let's look at this a little bit more in detail now. So if we look at the principal knowledge topics, so there's eight principal knowledge topic categories, uh, each being covered on the exam based on the established weights illustrated on the blueprint. So more specifically, we have professional conduct and regulation, which is covered on the exam by 7% of the content of the exam. Then we have the general financial planning principles, uh, which covers 17% 17, 17 of the exam. We have education planning, which constitutes 6% of the exam. We have risk management and insurance planning, which is 12% of the exam. Investment planning, which is 17% of the exam, tax planning, 12% of the exam, retirement savings and income planning, which is 17% of the exam, and estate planning, which is 12% of the exam. These are the categories. Of course, there's more knowledge elements, topics that are being un covered under each of those headings. So these knowledge topics from the 2015 job task analysis are the main structure of the content for the CFP examination. Then there's the financial planning job task domains. Uh, these domains that are defining the financial planning process. Uh, it, they are critical in practice of financial planning, and it's part of how the exam questions are developed to ensure full coverage of all components of the process. So the financial planning job task domains are establishing and defining the client planner relationship, gathering information necessary to fulfill the engagement, analyzing and evaluating the client's current financial status, developing the recommendations, 
communicating their recommendations, implementing their recommendations, monitoring the recommendations, and practicing with professional and a regulatory standard. One key aspect that came out of the emerging trend analysis and discussions um, with the job task analysis study is the holistic and integrated aspect of financial planning and the need to consider variables that are more about the context of a situation as opposed to just purely knowledge or tasks. In fact, a number of important variables are to be considered when dealing with specific financial planning situations in conjunction with knowledge and tasks. Uh, these are referred to as contextual variables and are used as part of content development for the CFP certification exams or other case-based scenarios. More specifically, financial planning situations require the application of financial planning knowledge for different types of clients. Uh, so there's different types of uh, family status, net worth, income level, life or professional stage, and other circumstances that would include you know, health issues, divorce, change of employment status, aging parents, special needs children. So the con contextual variables illustrate the holistic and integrated aspect of financial planning and are captured across the knowledge topics and job task domains. As indicated, uh, contextual variables are used to develop real-life scenarios and questions for the exam to ensure that what is being assessed on the exam is reflective of the practice of financial planning with different types of clients and situations. So let's look at specifically the key highlights in terms of the changes that are based on from the 2015 job task analysis. So it's important to note that uh, there's been some elements that have been refined or added topics, uh, and these are highlighted as, as follows. So there's uh, coverage of holistic and integrated financial planning, retirement savings and income planning, healthcare, education planning, and debt management. What's really important to know is that these although they are the highlights in terms of some of the changes from the 2015 job task analysis, they, they were not necessarily absent from uh, the exam content before or from education programs before. Now they're just a little bit more salient. So it's really critical to understand that it's not anything specifically new uh, and a lot of new content. This is all there. This was all there. Now it's just more fleshed out. So let's talk about the uh, CFP exam blueprint. So a blueprint defines the structure and what is to be assessed on the CFP exam. The examination blueprint is based on the principal knowledge topics. So each of the eight categories as defined a bit earlier with a specific weighting of each of the categories on the exam. There's a direct link between uh, curriculum objectives for education programs uh, and those principal knowledge topics, so the link is there. And these are used uh, and they provide consistency across certification requirements for both education and exam. Everything links together, it's all about the financial planning knowledge topics, uh, so that's, imp that's what's important to remember. Also important to note is that uh, if you have completed your education program a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, note that your education program is still current. As indicated, we fleshed out some of the, the knowledge topics. Uh, some of the things are more salient, but everything that you have covered is still current. Uh, you might want to kind of polish on some of those new elements or added elements or uh, fleshed out elements to help you out to prepare for the exam. But don't worry, what you've gone through is still current. So one other thing also that's important to mention uh, is about the CFP exam structure. So although we have a new blueprint based on the job task analysis from 2015, um, it, the, the exam structure hasn't changed. It's still the same type of exam, the same item type, multiple choice, same number of questions, there's 170 questions on the exam, uh, and any new question that 
are addressing the changes from the 2015 job task analysis have been developed and pre-tested in 2015. So we've tried it out, tested it out, made sure it works, um, but really, in a sense, what you need to remember is that you are not to expect something totally different from uh, what has been communicated in the past. It's the same type of exam, uh, six-hour exam, computer-based, same structure, and, uh, and uh, what you're doing in terms of preparing for the exam is still uh, what's required, uh, the same level of requirement, basically. So, you know, as I, um, I just alluded to, what does not change in addition to the structure of the exam uh, and what remains the same is the need to be well prepared for taking the exam. So preparing for the exam, as you already know, is critical for your success. You should be prepared to take the exam by knowing what to expect and what, what is expected of you uh, on exam day. The CFP board has compiled a few tips from current resources that outline strategies to build the foundation of a sound plan of study. So the first step in preparing to become, uh, is preparing to become more familiar with the exam. A deeper understanding of the exam structure and its component will help you to develop a plan to prepare for the exam. So refer back to the blueprint uh, and the list of principal knowledge topics in the financial planning domains. Understand what's been covered on the exam. Uh, that's kind of what's critical as a starting point. We recommend you develop a plan that provides adequate time for reviewing items related uh, to each of the knowledge topics and the domain as per the test blueprint. You should allow sufficient time to adequately review all eight major categories outlined by the principal knowledge topics and also by the domain list. In the course of your study, try to identify questions that could possibly be asked on the, on the exam. Try integrating ideas from your readings, lectures, and notes that could be used to develop practice questions. One recommendation is to practice using the CFP board practice exams and the sample questions that are available on the CFP board website or any other practice exams available through exam preparation vendors. Anything you can do to prepare to help practice, do more questions, it's always good. So we'll now talk a little bit more specifically about the upcoming March 2016 CFP exam and talk about some of the changes related to deadlines and exam fees. For the March 2016 CFP exam, there's a new pricing and deadline structure that has been introduced. Um, registration for the March 2016 CFP exam is actually open. Uh, it opened on November 23rd, and you are definitely encouraged to register as soon as possible to benefit from the early bird registration price and also get to schedule your appointment at your preferred testing center at the preferred time. So let's look at those deadlines and those fees, because those are new. This is critical that you be aware of that. So registration, as I've mentioned, is open now. Uh, and the early bird registration is up until January 19. So exam registration fee is $5.95, so same price as it's been for the last 15 years. Uh, so if you want to register early up to January 19, it's the same, you pay the same price as before, $5.95. Then if you register between January 20th, and February 16, which happens to be the education verification deadline and also the deadline for the regular registration fee, uh, you're going to pay $695 for your exam. The final deadline for registering for the exam is on March 1st. So note that if you do register between February 17 and March 1st, which, is, which are the last two weeks of the exam, you're going to pay $795. The exam testing window is between March 15 and 19. So things to note about those changes. Uh, as I mentioned just a bit earlier, the price for the CFP exam has not increased in 15 years uh, since the last price increase in 2000. We're keeping it constant for you at 595 for the first three months of registration. The planned uh, pricing tiers are intended to promote earlier registration and scheduling of test appointments, really to make sure that you get, uh, if you register early, you get uh, access 
to the date you're looking for and the exam center you're looking for. Also, if you do take advantage of an early bird pricing, uh, it's beneficial because you, know, you can get to schedule early. Uh, and it's also an earlier commitment, so you can start preparing for the exam uh, more in advance because you're already committed to sit for the examination. This is another illustration of uh, the registration timelines. So what you need to, uh, to consider here is that really for the first three months of the registration period, there's no change to the fee. It's the fee of $595 as per, per the last 15 years. But you need to take advantage of that before January 19, which is the deadline for the early bird. So let's talk about the March 2016 CFP exam results. Um, and that's something that is uh, very unique to the March 2016 exam. Uh, because uh, there are significant changes, we're looking at reassessing, relooking, there's a, based on the job task analysis of 2015, although there's no major changes from a content perspective, it's still important for the CFP board to be able to uh, review the passing standard. So in alignment with certification best practices, uh, we will be conducting a passing standard study for the March 2016 examination that would be applied for March and on. Um, consequently, preliminary exam result reports typically provided upon completion of the exam at the testing site will not be provided for the March 2016 exam, uh, examination. So withholding the preliminary result is necessary, again, in accordance with best practices and certification, to allow CFP board to review the impact of the new passing standard based on exam scores prior to releasing the final result. A final result letter will be released approximately three weeks after the close of the March 2016 exam testing window. Preliminary result reporting will resume for the July 2016 administration and on. So important to note, no preliminary result for March, only for March, but you will get final results within three weeks of the closing of the window. If you do want to have more information about what to expect from a computer-based test and what to expect, expect on exam day, uh, you can register for a webinar that will be conducted on Tuesday, January 12, 2016. Uh, topics that will be covered uh, here will do a brief review of the processes for online exam registration and test appointment scheduling. Uh, the webinar will focus on exam day experience from the check-in process to the computer-based testing on exam day, and as well as receiving and interpreting your exam results. So feel free to register if you want to have more information about the, 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 what to expect at the testing center and uh, scheduling for the examination as well for January 12th. So this concludes the formal presentation portion of the webinar. Um, we will be looking at answering questions as they come up. Uh, and uh, please do, do know, though, that if for some reason your, your question is not being addressed or you happen to have questions after uh, we end up the webinar, you can contact us at examinations.cfbboard.org or you can call the examinations program manager at the phone number that's listed here. So we're always here to help and uh, any specific question you might have, please do not hesitate to contact us. So I'll just take one or two minutes to review some of the questions that we have. Please stay on the line as uh, I'm sure some of those questions would be pertinent for the, the whole audience. Okay, so one of the questions we have here is, can you use study materials from previous years? And the answer to that is yes, you can, absolutely. Uh, what you've gone through is still current, it's still valid. What you want to do, though, as mentioned, is you want to go back to the list of principal knowledge topics 
review what's there, review the domains, uh, and look at some of the changes that were highlighted and see if you might want to uh, polish some of those elements that might be a little bit more salient now uh, to help you out and to be better prepared. But what you have uh, from before is still very much valid because a lot of it is still very much the same and very current. So one of the questions here is that why did you decide to change from the current format? So the idea here is that, again, is that the format is still the same, the structure of the exam is still the same. The reason why we're doing this is that this is one of the key requirements from a certification program perspective to stay current, is to review the practice at least every five years. So we need to look at this, look at trends, making sure we stay current. So the job task analysis needs to be completed every five years in order to help us determine are we still on track? Are we still covering the content we need to cover? Are there major changes in the practice of financial planning? And if so, let's make sure we're capturing that as part of the exam. So that's kind of what we've done. And as part of the exam, but also as part of our certification program. So this is part of best practices for certification. We need to make sure we're not becoming stale. We need to make sure that we are uh, on top of trends. Uh, and then it's exactly why we need to do this. And, and the last job task analysis that was performed was in 2009, so the timing was perfect to, uh, uh, to do this and now to move forward with the implementation of the outcomes of, of the job analysis. So another question is, how will the review programs be able to prepare with the new subject material? Very good question. So all of that uh, information has been released uh, in um, early January um, of this year. So all of the registered program, all of the prep course providers have, as well have been informed, as re have received all the information, and they, they had time to adjust wherever they needed to adjust. Again, because the changes are not necessarily that drastic, it's not like there's a major requirement to make major changes. But all of this has been communicated well in advance, almost a year ago, to all the programs, so they had a chance to adjust as, uh, as required. The question here is that the March 2016 exam is testing on 2015 tax code limits and exemptions. The answer to that is yes, because the changes uh, when we review and confirm the content for the exam, uh, the 2016 information is not necessarily all available. So that is why we are testing the 2015 tax code. So absolutely yes, the answer is yes. Will we receive results via email or mail or both? So you will be receiving, for your final result confirmation, you will be receiving a notification that uh, your results are available. You'll be receiving an email with your result letter. Uh, so that's going to be by email, not mail, just by email. And then from that, so you'll have your result letter, and then from there you'll be able to go and log in to your uh, CFP board portal uh, and proceed to the next steps uh, based on your results. So there's a question here is that uh, someone is asking, could we get a copy of the slides during this presentation for this presentation? Well, obviously not during the presentation, but just so you know, we will be posting uh, this webinar to our website uh, so you can access it if need be, and you can go through the slides again, uh, and that you should expect to see that uh, sometimes next week on our website. So there's a question here is that if we sign up early and decide we're not ready to go, uh, what does that mean? Is that, well, if you go and uh, withdraw from the exam, there's a $100 uh, fee attached to that. 
Um, but again, considering the pricing structure and also considering what is needed to prepare for this exam, we really do encourage you to register soon, as soon as possible. It's good uh, mentally to get prepared and also, again, from a scheduling perspective, you get to schedule early as well. So there's a question about uh, someone asking if uh, you can sign up uh, for the exam before uh, the education is completed and validated. Uh, the answer to that is yes, as long as you complete your education and you have validation proof of that before the education verification deadline, which is February uh, 19, uh, then you, there's, there's no problem. You can actually go and register for the exam. And sorry, it's February 16. My apologies. February 16 is the education verification deadline. So if you're not done yet, but you know you'll be done and have a confirmation of successful completion by education verification deadline of February 16, you can register for the exam, no problem. So just so you know, we're reviewing some of the questions and, and, and trying to uh, identify questions to address. Um, we'll just need a few more seconds. So there are some questions more specifically about the changes within each of the topics. And really, again, um, it's, there's not necessarily a, a, a huge need to go through and map out the changes because the changes are fairly minor. Uh, there's not necessarily major changes to the details within each category. One to note, and it was noted in the highlights, uh, education planning used to be under general uh, um, uh, financial planning processes. Uh, practices, but now it's a category in itself. So that's important. So that means there's a little bit more coverage of education planning now because it's a category, it's a main topic in itself. Um, another, uh, for example, another change is that for estate planning, there's not as many topics under estate planning compared to before. Uh, and really, there's no major changes there. It's just that we tidied it up. We cleaned it up a bit to make it more efficient, to better, to better illustrate what the topics under estate planning were. So really, I think what's critical from your perspective is to go look at the knowledge list, uh, the principal knowledge topics, review everything that's covered, make sure you're up to speed with every single topic there, because that's what's going to be tested on the exam. So there's a question about uh, why not provide immediate results. And as mentioned through the presentation is that we need, because we're going to be com completing a pass, uh, a standard setting process, which is a pass, uh, pass mark setting study, we need to have the data from the March exam in order to finalize decisions around pass mark. So we cannot generate the results until we have completed our in-depth review and analysis process. It's very, very important. And it's for you. It's good for you because we want to make sure that where we set the bar is appropriate. And we don't want to set the bar like way, 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 way too high where like everybody's not going to be successful. It's not going to be consistent with what we've had in the past. We need to make sure we set the standard at the right place and we need to be able to review that information to be fair to all of you. Someone is asking if the, we expect to have any changes to the practice exams that are offered. At this point in time, no. The practice exams that you have available uh, are going to be the, the ones that are currently up there. They're still very, very, very good. They still cover what needs to be covered. It's the representation of a sample of potential questions or of exam questions that have been put 
uh, in the past on the exam. So there's a great value to it. Uh, at some point in time, uh, within the next year, we'll be looking at possibly updating some of the practice exams. But at this point in time, uh, what's available is still current. Question here about uh, if the exam uh, pass score mm -hmm. is uh, based on a curve, on a bell curve. And the answer to that is no. We set a standard. That standard is the bar that we need people to meet. And it doesn't matter who's sitting for the exam. If it happens to be a group of superstars, then it means more people will pass because they all more people meet the standard. So it's extremely important to understand that. We're really not looking at it based on the bell curve, based on a specific percentage of people we're looking at passing. We are looking at establishing what's the minimum standard required to be competent in the practice of financial planning than to be successful on the examination. So there's another question here is that with, uh, will any of the questions from the 2015 exams be released? And the answer to that is, is no, is that we'll, we, are, we have a bank of questions. These questions from 2016 are still valid. They're still current because, again, there's not major, major changes to the content. It's not like we're revamping the whole content. So we are keeping our question bank from the exam current. We're taking from that question bank so we will not be releasing content from the 2015 exam because we're still using specific questions from our item bank in order to generate exams from one exam cycle to the other. Somebody is asking about the uh, when the timing in terms of when we, they will be you will be receiving the final results uh, for the March exam, and it's going to be the week of April 19th. So. Uh, to confirm, the week of April 19 is when you should expect to be receiving the, your, uh, your results for the March uh, 2016 exam. Okay, there's one, of the, one question about where can you find a, the new list of principal knowledge topics. Um, there's some links here, links here that we have for you. Uh, and one of them is uh, the exam blueprint, which in fact is also listing the 2015 principal knowledge topic list. So you can access that there. Uh, there's information about the 2015 job task analysis. Uh, as well, there's a link there. And we, I really, really encourage you to review the exam candidate handbook. This is a very useful document that includes information about the examination, about what to expect, how to register, uh, what's covered on the exam, how to prepare for the exam. It's a very valuable uh, document that you can print out if you want or have on your desktop and go through it uh, and it's accessible on the link that is shown currently on the screen. Someone is asking if, uh, in terms of the results, um, how does that work? And if you need to ha receive like high ratings on each of the knowledge topics area areas to be successful on the exam, the exam uh, you need to reach the minimal score for the exam. You don't need to meet a minimal score for each of the section. It's for the overall exam. Uh, but of course, if you shoot for high everywhere, then you're probably going to be successful. So I would encourage you to really, really work on uh, being successful at all levels and review all of the knowledge topics that will help you being successful on the examination.
Um, one last question uh, here that we have here are the cases and um, are the cases uh, the questions that are attached to a case weight higher than their regular multiple choice uh, questions? The answer to that is no. Every single question on the exam is worth one mark. So there's not more weight on the case questions uh, compared to what we call the standalone questions. Every single question on the exam is worth one mark. Well, we're very happy to have uh, been of assistance. Hopefully this webinar was helpful to you in terms of answering uh, a lot of the questions you might have had about the changes uh, upcoming for the March 2016 exam. Um, again, we're here to answer your questions. Um, if you have something specific you want to follow up us, uh, on, uh, on with us, please do so. Um, and contact us uh, at examinations at cfpboard.org or you can give us a call as well. We'll be happy to answer your questions. So thank you very much for attending, and have a great rest of the day.